Hello, and welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. I'm Jerry Reynolds, your guest host today. I'm head of outreach at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and I'm delighted to be host for today's Lunchtime Discovery Talk. The Lunchtime Discovery Series is organized by the North Carolina Office of Environmental, Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality and is broadcast by the Museum of Natural Sciences. We have a great presentation for you today. Who's in your backyard, the Owls of North Carolina? During the talk, please drop your thoughts, questions, or hoots in the chat on YouTube as we go, and we'll answer those questions after the talk. Our guest speaker today is Colleen Bocon. Colleen is an environmental educator and avid birder. She started her career as a ranger with North Carolina State Parks and is currently the assistant park manager of programs at Lake Crabtree County Park with Wake County Parks, Recreation, and Open Space. Uh, Colleen also volunteers with Wake Alderman and the Carolina Bird Club, leading bird walks and sharing her love of birds with others. Now, I've known Colleen for a number of years. She's very knowledgeable and is just a very nice person. However, I must warn you about her talk today. Foul language will be involved. Colleen, welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Thank you, Jerry. I think that's my best introduction ever. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm really glad to be here <laughs> and thank you all for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Very good. Take it away. All right. We looking good? All right. So as Jerry mentioned, I'm here to talk about the owls of North Carolina. Uh, we do have sort of a variety of owls. We have four that are basically considered residents, and we have another three that will visit us in the wintertime. So this is a great time of year to start to talk about them. And then we have one that sort of falls in the middle, and we will talk about that. So I always like to start anything I do with some general things about that group of animals. And instead of me talking about the amazing adaptations that owls have, I'm going to share a video from one of my favorite YouTubers, Zay Frank One, and he's going to share a more humorous approach to the facts about owls. Here are true facts. Here are, are true owls. facts about the owls. The owls are called owlets, and they look like a cotton ball that grew a face and legs. Owlets are born without flight feathers, and because they are vulnerable, they camouflage themselves as muppets. The owl has large front-facing eyes, which give it a wide range of binocular vision. Its eyes are nearly immobile in their sockets, and therefore it must swivel its head around its neck to see. Some owls bob their heads up and down in order to maximize their depth perception. Try it right now. Focus on an object and bob your head up and down. That's right, keep bobbing your head. It doesn't really work for humans, but you do look like an idiot. As the owl grows older, it develops its flying feathers, and oh my, that's cute. <laughs> He's like a little baby. <laughs> he likes being pet. It's really the eyes, isn't it? It's adorable. Oh, look, this one's playing with his friend. <laughs> Wait, what are you doing to that bird? Crap, you're not playing with... Don't try to hide it. I already saw it. Despite its cuddly appearance beneath those fluffy feathers, the owl is what we call a bird of prey. Because it eats prey. Just as the owls call us apes of the hamburger, because we eat hamburgers. The owl is a specialized hunting machine. Its talons are zygodactyl, two in front, two in back, and their grip is the strongest of the raptors. 500 pounds per square inch, eight times stronger than the human. Just for the record, this is why we wear a glove. They crush their victims, then tear off little strips before swallowing them whole, digesting them, and then vomiting out the bones and fur in a small pellet. And this is why it's polite to throw up at an owl dinner party. The owl is a quiet hunter. It has specialized feathers on the front of its wings that reduce turbulence and allow it to fly in relative silence. If silence were loudness, they would be the loudest flying bird. That's, that's a terrible metaphor. The owl's face is basically like a giant ear. 
the specialized feathers of its facial disc channel sound to its ear holes like a fuzzy satellite dish. Oh, that's nasty. Yep, that's an ear hole. Many owls have asymmetrical ear holes. One is higher than the other. By sensing tiny differences in the delay and volume of sound as it arrives in each ear, the owl is able to create a three-dimensional auditory map of its surroundings. Try riding a bicycle at night and picking up a moving burrito with your feet based on the sound that it makes. That is how an owl do. When they aren't being quiet, owls make a wide variety of sounds. Perhaps the most famous of these sounds is the sound made by some owls. It reminds me of the fairy tale where the young girl... Okay, sorry about that little fumble at the end there with the video. <laughs> so uh, there is more to that video. However, it gets a little bit PG after that point. So I wanted to make sure that I kept it family friendly for today. Uh, but Zay Frank One is a great YouTube channel to check out and he does many videos about a lot of really interesting animals around the world. So before we get into the serious stuff, I wanted to give you a few more fun facts about owls. If you've ever searched for owls on the internet, there are a lot of um, great photos out there. So the ones on the left show that many baby owls actually sleep on their stomachs because their heads are too heavy to be supported by their still developing muscles. So it's pretty cute to see some sleeping baby owls in that position. And a lot of folks don't realize that owls have really long legs. We just don't see them typically because they're covered by many, many feathers. So I don't know if the owls would appreciate me sharing these photos of them, but I find them pretty hilarious. So we are gonna get into our North Carolina specific owls. Just make sure y'all are paying attention. So our first is our Eastern screech owl. We're gonna start from our small, smallest state owl all the way to the largest. And we're gonna start with the ones that are actually year round residents. So the Eastern screech owl is our smallest. Um, the two calls you just heard are the two different calls that they can make. So one is the whinny, sort of that woo, and the second is a trill. They have excellent camouflage, as you can see. So they blend right in with tree trunks, which is where they're going to spend most of their time, either in a hollowed out area on a tree or somewhere on a branch. So again, you probably walk by these more than you'll ever see them. Here are a little bit more specifics on their measurements. So again, a very small owl and not getting to quite 10 inches in length. Um, their wingspan is also fairly small and they're going to be about the size of a robin. So a really great uh, website to visit to get more information about birds and everything you'd ever wanna know about birds is called All About Birds from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So you can get all of these really specific measurements and they have a great tool that they use that says, you know, is your bird about the size of a crow or about the size of a robin? Um, so this is a really good comparison to make. So folks sometimes don't realize just how small these owls can be. They have a pretty distinct silhouette and those ear tufts that you see are almost always erect or standing up. So they do tend to have a little silhouette if you do see them at night and you can kind of make out that shape. And it's a small owl, you've got your Eastern screech owl. In general though, they have a stocky body and they have a short uh, squared off tail and rounded wings. And they're not quite as piercing in this picture but they typically have yellow eyes and sometimes they can be a really bright yellow as well. A really neat interest, a really neat fact about the screech owls compared to some of the others is they are the one species that has distinct color morphs. So they can vary anywhere from that really pretty cinnamon rusty brown all the way to very gray and black. And there might be a few sort of tones in between. They are the only owl in North America that have these distinct plumage differences. Um, the two morphs are also geographically distinct. So the reddish kind of cinnamon color tends to be found more in the Southeast and the grayish owl tends to be more Northeast. So as far as the East Coast goes, we can kind of differentiate them between those two areas. Um, research has shown that the color morphs develop with light condition and prey condition. So again, they're sort of adapting to their environment and doing their best to blend in so that they can hunt. Here's the typical range of the Eastern Screech Owl. So as you can see here in North Carolina, like the rest of their range in North America, they are year round. 
so they will breed here and we can also see them this time of year as well, um, all the way through the summertime. And the brown morph you see there is, this, is another distinct morph that occurs mainly in Florida. As far as prey goes, they do eat a variety of different foods. Uh, one thing that's interesting to note is you'll see there's a picture of an Eastern screech owl. Um, that's not to show them, but it's actually because they're cannibalistic. So in addition to all of these other animals, they may on occasion go after one of their own. So it's very tough to be an owl, especially if you're a small owl. So as they can be predators for these other animals, they tend to also be prey for larger owls, which we'll see again in some other um, food networks that we'll see. But again, it's kind of interesting to see as distinct from some other predators, they do have a wide variety of food. So they'll eat anything from earthworms and crayfish all the way up to birds and bats. And of course, a lot of us tend to think of owls as eating small mammals and they certainly will go for those as well. As far as nesting and breeding goes, um, they typically use existing cavities. Since they are small, they can go and use maybe an old woodpecker hole, other, other parts of the trees that have been opened up by things maybe like wood ducks. They tend to not add anything to the nest, so they just sort of use what's there. They're kind of lazy nest builders. They will lay between two to six eggs and they have one brood per year. So they're not going to have more than that. It does take a lot of raptor babies quite a long time to develop into being independent. So it takes all of their energy just to get through one brood. And you can see the incubation and nesting period, nestling period there. So again, they're going to be sitting on eggs for quite a while and then also taking care of those babies for up to a full month. They have some pretty interesting predator evasion techniques. So as I mentioned, they do fall prey to other owls. And one is in the little inset on the left. This is the, I'm a lot bigger than you think I am. You should be really scared and leave me alone method. And then there's my favorite, which is the, you don't see me because I am a stick method. So both of these tend to work pretty well for them. Um, I would love one day to actually see a screech owl in that little stick pose. So our next largest owl that we can find in North Carolina year round is the barn owl. Uh, this is an owl that not a lot of people are lucky enough to experience or see. Um, and that is because unfortunately their numbers have been in decline for several years now. So there are sort of a handful of places around North Carolina and even South Carolina that are sort of known nesting locations, but birders and other folks that are interested in helping to conserve them often are sort of secretive about where you can find them because we don't want to continue to disturb the remaining pairs or birds that are left in our area. And hopefully they'll, they'll be able to rebound and there are quite a few conservation efforts to maybe help that out, um, but they really are declining. And a big part of that is, is they really do stay connected to sort of old barns and buildings and that tends to be their preferred area to roost and nest. And if you've ever heard a barn owl, it's something you won't soon forget. So here is their call here. Definitely not something you want to hear when you're camping out in the middle of the woods at night. I think that would probably jolt you awake pretty fast. Um, as far as identification goes, they have that pretty unique and um, distinct facial disc. So a very white facial disc surrounded by that brown color. As far as the overall body color, they have sort of cinnamon and gray mixed in. They have sort of a white belly with lots of little speckles. And they have that white heart-shaped face, dark eyes, which is pretty distinctive among the owls, as you will see. Uh, the females are often darker than the males as far as the backs, but there is a lot of variation. And the female has those spots that sort of go across her head and throat. Um, and apparently it's not just for looks. It will show, depending on how many spots she has, the more spots means she's more resistant to parasites. And this is actually a feature that males find attractive. So she's showing off her spots and hopefully she's the lady with the most spots or freckles. So compared to our tiny little screech owl, which is about the size of a robin, our barn owl is closer to the size of a crow. So you can see its measurements there. 
Um, so again, still fairly small when we think about owls in general. Um, in flight, they have long rounded wings, a fairly short tail, and they actually have a bit of a distinctive flight. So it's sort of a, a loping flight. So it'll sort of kind of drift up and down, up and down, up and down. So it doesn't sort of soar in a straight line as we think of most raptors. If you've ever watched an eagle or a hawk kind of soar and then go after prey, they tend to stay pretty straight and pick up speed. And these almost fly more like a moth. They kind of bounce around a little bit. So while the barn owl is not very common here in North Carolina, among owl species, it's actually got one of the largest worldwide distributions. So as you can see here, it's found in just about every continent. Um, it's just not found in polar or desert regions um, and sort of north of a lot of areas. So they don't like it super cold apparently, but they appear have the ability to adapt to a lot of different climates, um, which is pretty interesting. And I'm sure there are some color variations across the globe, um, but again, they, they are the same species, just in different areas. Here's our North American range of the common barn owl. So again, you can see it covers a good portion of North America. And again, here in North Carolina, it is a year round resident and they will be found mainly in farm areas. So they do require large open areas. And again, where you would find them during the day roosting would most often be in an abandoned building or an old barn or something similar. You're really not going to see these sort of walking down a wooded trail like you would expect to see some of our owl species. As far as nesting and breeding goes, um, when they do have suitable habitat in different areas of the world, sometimes they'll use things like uh, cavities, so things like caves, other little depressions, cliff ledges, again, human structures is very popular with them. And a lot of times the females will make nests out of their own regurgitated pellets, which is a fancy way of saying puke. So I'm not sure how the babies feel about that, but apparently it works out okay for them. Um, very much like the screech owl, they lay about two to six eggs a year. And again, one brood per year, which is pretty typical for raptors as a whole. And a fairly similar incubation and nestling period as well. So again, uh, raptor babies, they tend to be big babies for a really long time. Um, we have eagles that nest here at Lake Crabtree. And it's amazing that even when they reach full grown and the ability to fly, they still like to have mom and dad bring them their food for as long as possible. They really don't want to grow up. So males will have that moth flight that they do for courtship and they'll also hover for periods of time. So this is sort of a courtship ritual they do with the females um, and they'll dangle their feet in front of the females. So maybe the ladies like to check out the boys' feet and the boys like to check out the ladies' freckles and then the magic happens after that. They have a little bit more uh, specific dietary preferences. So again, we're seeing mostly small mammals here. And this also sort of falls in line with the type of habitats they prefer, which would be large open areas. So if you think about things like farm fields or meadows, you're certainly going to find a lot of small mammals in those areas. And they will also go after small birds as well. So for example, the European starling up there in the right top corner, um, they're no problem catching other birds and especially things like starlings that will be in large flocks. Um, chances are they're going to nab at least one in the group if they go after them. So on the bottom, uh, barn owls and one of the reasons for their decline is that they are more susceptible to poisonings than some of the other species because they are living and hunting in human populated areas. And of course, when many humans have things like mice or rats infesting their houses, or especially if you own a farm and you're growing things like grain, you don't want a lot of small rodents around. So you may put things out like poison to get rid of those small mammals. But unfortunately, when that is ingested by the owl going through those small mammals, it's affecting the owls as well. So many owls end up getting really sick and also dying from poisonings, even though they're accidental and folks aren't meaning to actually poison the raptors. It's just what happens with that food chain. So we're getting into our two probably most commonly encountered owls in the state. So these are probably who's most likely in your backyard. This would be one of them. This is our barred owl. So I would say most folks are familiar with them if they know any owls in their area. I know I've heard them in my neighborhood 
quite often and I've actually been lucky enough to see them in my yard on occasion. I do have a little bit of woods in the back, um, but as you can see, they have a mottled brown and white pattern. They have this vertical streaking in the front, so you can only see a little bit of the breast area on this bird, but you can see that those brown spots are sort of vertical stripes going down, and this is, will become important when you're distinguishing between owls. Um, they have horizontal bars across the back, as you can see, so you can sort of see that brown and white horizontal pattern. Their tail is also brown and white with bars, and they have excellent camouflage for daytime roosting. So barred owls are often active in the daytime as well. Um, when I worked at Eno River State Park, we had a trail and almost every day between three and four, if you walk down that trail, you would encounter the same barred owl. So they can be hunting during the daytime and often will wake up from their sort of naps to be a little bit active and they don't really mind being out in the open as much as some of the other species do. So often the male and females of the species are nearly identical, but the females are 30% larger than the males. So if you ever get to see a pair sitting next to one another, you can tell who the male and the female are based just on size. And this is true for many raptor species. The, the females are almost always a good amount larger than the males to where you can actually tell the difference if they're together. They have a lot of different calls. So we're gonna hear three different calls. The first one is going to be their typical call, the who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. Then there's just some random hoots. And in the second one, you'll actually hear the owl that's up close and the owl further away that's answering. And the last one is what I refer to as the monkey call. And I'll let you decide if you agree. <laughs> Not quite who cooks for you, but it's getting there. really hard not to listen to that last one and not laugh. And I will say I've been lucky enough to hear that in real life on more than one occasion. And it's also really hard not to laugh in that situation either. It's kind of hard to take them serious when they're making those sounds. So here are the barred owl measurements. Uh, they are somewhere between a crow and a goose. So they are larger than our barn owl. And you can see their specifics there. Um, Again, they can camouflage themselves in a lot of different situations, maybe not snow on that lower left picture, um, but even in situations where they are sort of in fields, um, they have those stripes in the front. So again, you can imagine them sitting in sort of that background and really blending in if they're not moving around very much. Here's the range of the barred owl. So again, this is one of our four year round residents here in North Carolina, covering the, the entire state again. Um, and they do prefer uh, forests. So mixed forests with large trees. A lot of times they'll be found near water. So that could be a stream, a river, sometimes lakes. And if there's a good area of forest right near a body of water, they're probably going to be there. Um, their habitat can range all the way from upland forests down to swamps, but they really tend to prefer sort of unfragmented forests with really mature trees, which are getting harder and harder to find. And a lot of those types of habitats are a lot smaller than they used to be. Um, but again, they've been very adaptable to suburbs and parklands as well. So unlike the barn owl, um, they've really decided that they can sort of stretch outside their comfort zone when it comes to habitats. And as long as they have a nice tree for nesting and roosting and ample prey items, they should be okay pretty much anywhere they go. Here is a look at their diet. So again, a very variety, very big variety of food items. Um, everything from crayfish and lizards all the way up to some slightly smaller mammals like the rabbits and the squirrels. Um, but again, they'll also eat birds and other small animals as well. Um, owls are fairly opportunistic. So if it's moving and it's edible and they can catch it, they're probably going to eat it. This 
So for nesting, again, because they prefer mature forests with large trees, they really like cavity nests. So they're gonna need a, a, small, a, a larger cavity than our little screech owl does. Um, they tend to be fairly high up in the tree, so it may be hard to spot them and really be able to watch the nest in action, so 20 to 40 feet high. Um, they often will use existing platforms, so the same types of platforms that folks put out for things like osprey um, in the right habitat can certainly be used for owls. Sometimes they'll add some items like feathers and lichens just to soften it and make it nice and cozy for the babies. Um, they do lay sometimes less eggs than some of the other seasons, so one to five. Again, one brood per year. And here's what the babies sound like when they're begging for food. <laughs> So there have recently been some news reports of people being attacked by owls, and this has um, sometimes been attributed to barn owls. So they're barred owls. They are very aggressive in defending their nests. So they will swoop down towards humans to let you know that you are too close. So if you ever go hiking in an area or even walk around your neighborhood and you notice an owl is swooping down at you or your neighbors, it's probably because you are too close to an owl nest which is really cool and you can check it out, but you certainly might want to find another uh, route to walk or jog. A little fun fact about barred owls is that a lot of them end up getting belly feathers that appear to be sort of a pinkish tinge. And that is in areas where they live in swamps or other places where they're eating a large amount of crayfish. And so that that pink color is actually transferring from all of the crayfish that they are ingesting. So it's kind of an interesting little fun fact that I came across. That bottom picture shows you the edges of the feathers. So we've all heard that owls have silent or near silent flight. And that's because the edges of their feathers are softer and have those little um, frilly edges versus the really stiff feathers you see in hawks and other birds that make a lot of sound when they flap their wings. And again, that was mentioned in the video, but this is sort of a close up of those feathers. Okay, so now on to our biggest year round resident owl, the great horned owl. Again, this is one that a lot of folks are becoming more and more accustomed to and actually getting to see because they have also started to move into suburban areas and even suburban areas. Um, Compared to the other owls, you can see they have these ear tufts, so kind of large ear tufts, not always standing straight up. So again, sometimes this is the profile that you will see. They have short, broad wings, which are really great for maneuvering. So if you're hunting in the middle of a forest and you're having to work your way around a lot of trees and branches, you don't want to have your wings be too long. And that's why the barn owl tends to have long wings because it's in open areas. But great horned owls tend to have just really broad, short, short and sort of stubby wings. If you've ever seen one fly over or seen a silhouette of it in flight, it really does have very wide but short wings. So it's a pretty distinct silhouette when you do get to see it. Now the call that they're known for is the who's awake, me too, which is what we'll hear now. <laughs> And you can hear the male and female answering back to one another there. So moving on to their measurements. Um, again, they're gonna be similar in size to the barred owl, but they are slightly larger. Um, between a crow and a goose is sort of the, the measurement we're going with. So. Um, again, not quite as large as a goose. That would be a little unwieldy to be up in a tree and be that large. Um, and you can see the baby next to the adult there on the bottom. So they do change quite a bit from the time that they are juveniles up to when they are adults. And compared to the barred owl that had the vertical stripes on the breast, you can see that great horned owls have horizontal stripes. So it's a very different look from the front. Um, and again, the ear tufts in this, position, in this picture are raised. So that's a really great distinct silhouette to see. 
Um, but again, very modeled on the back. So we're getting hues of dark brown, sometimes even black or gray, and then that really nice rusty cinnamon color. And you'll, as you saw in the first picture, and you can kind of see in this picture, they have those really piercing bright yellow eyes. So again, year-round resident, um, you can kind of see that they cover more territory than the barred owl and the other owls did. So they're much more adaptable to colder weather. So you can see them going all the way up into Northern Canada and even Alaska. Uh, so they're more adaptable as far as climate goes. Um, and again, you won't see them too much further south. I think they actually do prefer some amount of cold. I don't know how well they would really do if it was super tropical all of the time. Um, but that's a pretty good range across North America. Um, they tend to gravitate towards secondary growth woodlands. So they don't necessarily need, you know, very mature older trees, but they do like a good mix of trees and certainly need larger ones in order to nest and roost. Um, they can vary in their habitats, but they're always gonna want to have at least some forest nearby. And again, just like the barred owl, they've really adapted to be found pretty commonly in the suburbs and also parks not too afraid of people. Uh, they have a little bit more of a larger mammal variety of food. So again, they're still gonna eat a lot of the things that our smaller owls eat, such as toads, uh, small birds. Uh, we're starting to add fish into the mix. So people don't always think about owls eating fish. We tend to think of ospreys and eagles. But again, if they're near a body of water, they're gonna go for whatever prey items they can catch. Uh, they will eat smaller owls. So this is one of those predators that the screech owl needs to look out for. Um, so again, screech owls have to look out for their own, but also larger owls like the great horned owls. And one of their food items I found particularly interesting was the skunk. So again, birds aren't really known for having much of a sense of smell. So I guess that's a really good benefit if you're going to eat things like skunks. Here's a little bit about their nesting and breeding habits. So like a lot of the other owls, uh, they're kind of lazy when it comes to building nests. They really prefer to use existing platforms, uh, cavities, or other man-made structures. They've been known to steal hawk nests or leftover squirrel nests, depending on how big they are. Uh, they sometimes will add their own feathers to it, again, to sort of make that lining for the babies to be nice and cozy. Uh, they lay one to four eggs a year, so a lot of times you may only see one or two juveniles in a nest by the time everything is said and done. And again, like all of our other owls are doing one brood per year. They actually have one of the earliest uh, nesting season of any bird in North America and certainly among the raptors. Um, so great horned owls, they'll start to um, call and do their courtship in October. So typically around this time of year, they're starting to work up towards their peak of calling and courtship behavior leading into December. And then it sort of peaks December into January and then nesting starts so usually sometime in January. So they're getting a head start on a lot of other bird species as far as nesting and starting with their offspring. And here's another little snippet of babies begging for food. So they're not very polite about it. Um, great horned owls have a lot of really interesting behavior. Um, so again, they are very territorial and can be very aggressive uh, towards other owls, other raptors, or pretty much anything else that comes within their territory. Um, so again, they have that very um, scary yellow eyed stare that we can see in the top left and you know, bunching themselves up. The uh, bottom left picture always cracks me up. So talk about making yourself as big as possible. So they're using both their tail and their full wings to just make themselves look about 10 times bigger than they actually are. So I think if they get really freaked out, that's probably what you're going to see. They can be very vocal and make some harsh calls just like we heard with the babies. Um, and they're very often getting mobbed by smaller birds. So mobbing is a behavior that a lot of birds will use and crows are really good at this. But anytime there's a raptor like a hawk or an eagle or an owl that is near their nest and their family, they get really territorial themselves. So you'll see a lot of little birds ganging up on a big bird trying to drive it out of the area. Because again, nobody wants a predator sitting in their backyard waiting to pick them off. 
Um, and you can see that very brave mockingbird just about landing on that great horned owl in the bottom right hand picture. So here's a little um, snippet of them being not so happy. <coughs> I don't know if that sound is quite as intimidating as the babies asking for food, but I guess it works for them. So here's just some more funny pictures of our poor great horned owls getting harassed. Um, so you can see that little group of crows and one is definitely being vocal added in that tree in the top left. Um, there's a little series of photos on the bottom where the crow is just first starting off flying at the, the owl in the front. And then finally, when the, even when the owl takes off and finally gives up and moves on, the crows really wanna make sure that they're going to stay away. So they'll follow them and make sure they've fully driven them out of the area. And then I just love the look on the face of the owl in the top right corner because he just looks really annoyed by that robin doing its best to drive it off. So now we're gonna move into some owls that are not so common in our backyards. Um, and early on in the talk, I mentioned that we have four species that are our year round residents, which we just covered. And then we have three that are possible to see in the winter. And then one that sort of fits both categories. And the one that's sort of in the middle is our Northern Sawwet owl. Um, this is actually my favorite owl because it's just so tiny and cute. It is the smallest owl in North America. Um, so it has that distinction. And um, they only get to be about eight inches long where our screech owl can get to be about nine and a half up to maybe 10. So this is a pretty tiny owl. Um, and it just has such a cute little face and I love his little feet sticking out on the bottom there. Um, but you can see again, that beautiful modeling of brown and white makes him perfect and really great to camouflage against those trees. So in North Carolina, your best bet for seeing a Northern Sawa owl will be in the mountains, generally around the Blue Ridge Parkway. Um, and this map shows some known nesting locations for them. So again, they are known to be residents in North Carolina, but really strictly just in the mountain area. Um, so these are all confirmed sightings with the circles. But as you can see, if you're you know, hoping to run out to the mountains to, to go for a weekend and see a Northern Sawa owl, good luck. Um, I have tried many times and I have yet to see this species in the mountains of North Carolina. However, I've been lucky enough to see it out at the Outer Banks at Body Island because every so often we get these winter vagrants that decide to come down to North Carolina either for short term or long term during the winter. So again, you're really not going to see any breeding populations of Sawa owls anywhere but in the mountains of the state, but you can get lucky enough, especially at the coast um, this time of year going into maybe January or February, and you might get lucky enough to see or hear one maybe at the Outer Banks or somewhere else along the, the inland coast. Another one of our winter visitors is the short-eared owl. Um, they are actually the most common, commonly spotted out of all of our winter visitors. Um, they are typically seen, again, mostly towards the coast. Um, for some reason, they just prefer that habitat. So Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge would be a great place to look for them. And I actually saw one of them there back in January. And I hope to repeat that when I return in January of 2023. Um, they can be found in other places across the state. So there have been sightings in the Piedmont and the mountains, which you can see on this map here. So this shows the counties that have been, uh, have had reports of short-eared owls. And usually with these um, distribution maps, they really try to confirm those sightings before they fill in that county. So these are, you know, pretty, you can go off of this as a pretty good representative of where these owls have been seen in the state. But you can see quite a few coastal counties are represented here. So again, that's really going to be the best place to try to find them in the winter. And again, that's the only time of year you, you can go out to see them. They're really not going to be here in North Carolina any other time of the year. So bundle up and head out to the Outer Banks. So with our short-eared owl, we also have the long-eared owl. This is another winter visitor. Um, you can see where it gets its name. So unlike the short-eared owl, which does have ear tufts, but you almost never see them, the long-eared owl has these really long ear tufts, probably the longest out of all of the owls, hence the name. Um, again, this really disc-shaped face, um, 
very long bodied owl. So it can also be called the long bodied owl because it really is a little bit longer than the typical owl. Um, they are a rare visitor in both the Piedmont and the coastal plain. So again, in the reverse of the short-eared owl, um, if you really want to try to see a long-eared owl, your best bet is to go to the mountains. So short-eared at the coast, long-eared in the mountains. Um, but it is possible because there's always those weird vagrants that show up. So again, we've had a sighting of long-eared owl in Wake County in the past, which would be really amazing. If one would love to stop by Lake Crabtree and in, in see me, I would be really excited about that. Um, I have yet to see this owl species. So another owl that all the bird watchers get really excited about when it shows up in North Carolina is the snowy owl. Um, and this is sort of way beyond what would typically be considered their range. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead to this next slide really quick just to show you the range and then go back to that first picture. Um, but as you can see, we are not even anywhere in their typical range. Um, you'll see that little blue line of dots that kind of cuts across the United States right around uh, the edge of North Carolina and Virginia. Um, so these are a bit outdated maps. So really that line should be a little bit further south because snowy owls have been seen in North Carolina for several years now. Um, we're lucky if we get maybe one over the course of a, of a winter. Sometimes we might get more than one throughout the state, um, but they're just such a rarity that everybody gets really excited when they show up. Um, what happens is that line is showing their eruptive year and eruptions occur when food is scarce or there's other some other sort of climate change or impact in their typical range that is pushing them outside of that comfort zone. So they're gonna come down and keep moving until they find a suitable habitat with plenty of food and the type of area that they like. And snowy owls tend to prefer large open areas because they're more typically found in sort of the tundra. So think flat, not a lot of trees. And this is why a lot of the time when snowy owls come to North Carolina, they're gonna be found out on the beaches along the outer banks. They've also been found in sort of the Piedmont area near airports. So again, very big, open, vast areas that they can see for a long, long area, or sorry, see for a long distance and be able to hunt in their preferred uh, type of habitat. So snowy owls are one of the few sexually dimorphic owls that we have. Um, so you can tell right here, we have a male and a female. Um, can anybody guess who is who? So I'll give you a hint. Um, I would guess that he didn't take out the trash this morning because she looks really annoyed. So uh, the males have that just pure white plumage, so no spots to be seen. And the females have this really pretty modeling of sort of dark brown or black and white. And that is because they will spend a lot of their time uh, at the nest. And so with the habitat that they're found in typically, she's much more able to be camouflaged. So we have a lot more information on how often snowy owls have been seen in North Carolina versus our other winter vagrants, because there's actually a big project that's been going on for several years known as Project Snowstorm, where they track individual owls and they're monitoring exactly where these owls are found. So between birders entering information into things like eBird, um, there's also this really great project where they're really getting good information on population numbers and also the distances and the areas that these owls are flying to. So you can see there, this is sort of a little listing of some of the incidents of snowy owls in North Carolina. Um, one was seen earlier this year, so we do always have a good chance of them being seen again this coming winter. Um, and unfortunately, when it comes to things like the short-eared owl and the long-eared owl, there's just not as much information out there about them. So it's really hard to say exactly how many do show up in our state, uh, because other than the odd birder, you know, reporting a sighting or hearing them, if you don't have pictures or recording, it's really hard for people to verify that information. And so it's really difficult to get more specific information on just how likely it would be to encounter a long-eared owl or a short-eared owl. But the science is getting better and better about those snowy owls. Okay, so with that, I'm going to stop talking and see what questions folks have. Wow, Colleen, that was great. You you shared a lot of great information about owls. I was learning as we went along, and you probably covered every question that could be asked, but we do, do have a few questions in the chat. Uh, 
uh, just to clarify some some things people are wondering about. Uh, Courtney was wondering about screech owls. Uh, are they found throughout North Carolina or are they more common in some areas than others? So I, I, as far as I know, they are found throughout the state. Um, and I think as far as, you know, if they're common in one area versus another, I know that I hear them and hear of stories of them throughout the Piedmont pretty often. Um, and I would think that they would be pretty happy in the mountains and coastal plain as well. So I would assume that they're pretty good all over the state. Okay. And Courtney is also asking if there are barred owls in one territory, can screech owls also be found there or will they chase each other out or the barred owls chase the smaller screech owls out? That's a great question. I can't speak specifically to that. So my, my guess would be that the screech owls might want to relocate uh, just because they might fall prey to a barred owl. I mean, even though great horns are the ones that are known to prey on screech owls, I just wouldn't want to be the little owl in a big owl's territory, but maybe that's just me. Uh, and, and I'm gonna add one of my questions, uh, barred owls and great horned owls. When I first moved into where I'm living now in Johnson County, I heard great horned owls for the first several years. Then at some point, it transitioned to where I only hear barred owls. So what kind of competition do we have going on with those? Right. And and I and I think it's interesting. It seems like year to year. I don't know if it's like the it's like first come, first serve, if they're not sticking around that same spot year round. If somebody moves in and sets up their tor territory first, maybe that other owl just says, okay, you know what, I'm just gonna go down the road a ways and find my own patch of trees. Uh, but yeah, that's interesting because I've had the same thing happen in my my neighborhood as well. So one year it's the great horned owls and next year it's the barred owls. Sometimes I've heard screech and great horn, but not quite in the same exact spot in the neighborhood. Like one's further out and one seems closer. So again, I don't know exactly how big their territories get, but maybe they're just sort of on the outskirts of each other's boundaries and everybody plays nice at that point. <laughs> right, well, well, the barred owls are very vocal in the woods behind my house. And one of my neighbors called me one time, said, there's a bunch of monkeys back there. What's going on? And so I knew, knew immediately what he was talking about. Uh, the monkey call, as as you mentioned earlier. Uh, Susie asked, are barn owls more prevalent in certain areas of the state, mountains or coastal? So the one barn owl I have seen and the ones that I've heard from other people have been sort of um, western part of the state. Um, I'm sure it is possible, and there's probably some that are more in the eastern part of the state, especially since we do have a lot of, um, you know, big farmland out in that part of the state. So I would assume mountains and, and coastal plain are probably much easier to find them than anywhere in the Piedmont. And again, it's just a lot, a lot to do with how much things have been built up and the lack of habitat in our area. Okay. Uh, this is from C. Johnson. Uh, I had a barred owl as an unexpected guest a few months ago. It crashed through my screen porch and I had to help it out on the end of a broom. Wing spread and a snapping with its beak, but beautiful. <laughs> so that was that was a great observation wow. uh, from that from that viewer. Uh, I bet that was a handful too. <laughs> uh, now uh, Caitlin is asking uh, what can be done to encourage the presence of owls and and Caitlin apparently lives next to Croatan Forest which is primarily longleaf pine and she's asking primarily about barred owls. Um uh, yeah that's a great question. So definitely you you already are in an area where it's some really nice habitat for them. Um one thing as far as neighborhoods go depending on on what your neighborhood is like is you know really trying not to have a lot of light. Um, I know that, you know, in, in my neighborhood, I keep all my lights off outside of my house. And so I think that's why I end up with the owls in my yard versus my neighbors that have all kinds of spotlights that come on and shoot in every possible direction. Um, so again, owls are just like a lot of other birds and, and that light is really going to mess with them, especially at night when they're trying to hunt. Um, so I would just say, you know, if you have the right habitat, just make it as dark and you know, non-disturbed as possible, um, you're not having a lot of activity. So again, I doubt folks will get a lot of owls if they have, you know, if you have dogs in your yard that stay outside all the time. So just think of things that would probably keep you awake at night, um, would probably be the same things that would keep the owls awake at night. So that would be the only thing I could really think of that you could do to encourage them. Okay. 
Uh, let's see, uh, Ed. Let's see, he he's asking, but he says it, it seems that the sound that I hear on trails and in the neighborhoods uh, in Wake County are most similar to the barred owls. Are they the most common in the Wake County area? I would say so. So just strictly, you know, thinking about numbers, most folks that I talk to, and when I, you know, when we talk about the calls most of the folks say, okay, yeah, it's definitely a barred owl in my yard. So I think within Wake County, we certainly have a good number of great horned owls, but barred owls tend to be the ones I think people encounter more than anything. So I'd say they're probably the most common in our area. Okay. Uh, and here's a question from Lisa. Uh, curious, how long have you been birding? Oh, I don't know if I should share that. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so I think uh, without trying to do the math, I think it's about 27 years, <laughs> a lot, um, but I still learn new things every day, which is why I love birding because you, you can never know everything. And that's why I love doing programs like this because I have to study and learn really cool facts that I didn't know beforehand either, so. Very, very good. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions. It looks like uh, that may be about the end of questions that we have thus far. Uh, I'm seeing one thing show up here. Can you share your favorite encounter or observation of an owl? Sure, so that's actually a recent one. Um, I was at Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, um, and this is back in January, and uh, we were specifically out there to wait and hope to see a short-eared owl. And I've seen them out there before, so that if you've never been to Alligator River, I highly recommend it. It's amazing, and not just for the birds, um, but there's these huge fields, and I've seen them on the other side of the field. So somebody would say, oh, that's a short-eared owl. And I'd see this tiny little speck and I'd go, okay, sure, I believe you. I guess I can count that. But I hadn't really gotten my life look yet. And so this past January, we were standing on the road and I, I was the one that spotted the owl first, which made it exciting for me. And I was like, I think I got one, I think I got one. And then here it came straight at us and it actually flew over our heads. So we got to see the face and everything. And we all just sort of stood there like, Oh, and watched it go over. And I'll probably never get another look that good at an owl ever again. And that was a pretty special moment for sure. Yes, that's great. And and you probably experienced the silence of that flyover too, because I've actually had a barred owl fly over me on a wooded trail and you know looked up at the right time to see it because we would have never heard it at all. It was it's it's like, wow, did that really fly over? So. Exactly. Yeah, they, they truly are magic. I think that's why so many people are interested in them, even if they're not interested in other birds. For some reason, owls really capture our imagination. And that's part of it is those once in a lifetime encounters. And it's just it's kind of unworldly that they really don't make any sound. Right. Yeah. It's like, like how can how can they do that? <laughs> be so, particularly a bard, I'll be so big to fly over you and, and you don't hear anything. So that's that, that is incredible. Uh, here's a, a question. And I'm not really good with acronyms. So maybe you are, Colleen. Are there any MOTUS tagging projects being done with owls in North Carolina? Do you know what MOTUS is? Yeah, give, give me a second so I can like remember the whole thing that it stands for. It's um, they're basically um, I'm trying to think. I just call it MOTUS. This is what's bad about acronyms. <laughs> um, <laughs> But basically, they are tracking stations. So any birds that have been tagged. Um, these these towers will pick them up. And so that's how folks are able to map migrations of, of different uh, birds across our state, but all, or across our country, but also throughout the world. I um, mean, I know that there are more towers being built in North Carolina, so our network is growing. Um, I don't know of anything in particular specific to owls, but that would be something worth looking into that I will actually look at now because now I'm curious. Um, but I do know that our network within North Carolina is growing, so we should get more and more information about where these owls are specifically going. Okay, uh, I'm I'm not seeing any more questions, but uh, apparently there are lots of hoots in terms of thank yous and great presentations, comments in the chat. So uh, we're really uh, glad to see that, and uh, I've really have enjoyed this too. Uh, thank you so much, Colleen, for you know, being with us on the lunchtime discovery series today, and and sharing all this great information about owls. Now we know 
who's in our backyard and a lot more really fascinating uh, talk about uh, a really great group of, of birds. Thank you for having me. And again, if folks wanna learn more about owls or other birds, I highly recommend checking out All About Birds, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology website. And also if you don't already have the Merlin app on your phone, you need to get it because you can record those calls and it'll tell you which owl you're listening to. And it's also fun to learn all of the other local birds as well. So thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you. Thank you again, Colleen. And, and thank you viewers for watching and sharing today as well. Uh, remember to follow the Office of Environmental Education on Facebook and Twitter uh, at North Carolina EE, and their website is eenorthcarolina.org. And of course, follow the museum on all social media uh, at Natural Sciences and upcoming programs that we have on naturalsciences.org. And if you haven't been to uh, you know, Lake Crabtree Park, you need to go there. That's also a wonderful place to experience nature. So until next time, Take care. Hootie hoot.